A very good morning, uh, colleagues. Uh, good morning to the participants in this webinar. Uh, my name is Sandy Lembata. I'm going to be chairing uh, this plenary session. Um, I've already started to be provocative, firstly to the organizers. Uh, so I have to be provocative before I thank them. If we talk inclusion, um, do, we, do we include items like national anthems that are uh, items of exclusions themselves? Um, I thought we will sing uh, Enoch Sontonga's uh, Africa Anthem that is much more inclusive at a regional level, but again, that is me being provocative. But before 
Uh, or after that, uh, that provocation, um, I want to firstly congratulate the organizers of this conference, the University of KwaZulu Natal, um, and the leadership of uh, Prof. Magidimisha Chipungu and Prof. Chipungu on leading the organization of this conference and putting together quite enticing speakers that are very insightful. Um, congratulate all the sponsors, the NRF, the South African Cities Network, ISOCAP, uh, UJ, University of Johannesburg, University of Venda, um, the South African Planners, um, South African Council of Planners, uh, the Journal of Inclusive and Built Environment, um, uh, the Sachi Chair of Inclusive Cities, um, and any other sponsors that would have contributed uh, to a successful hosting of this conference. And also to thank the virtual host of this conference, because if we sing the national anthem, we are assuming that it is hosted in South Africa, even though it's virtual. Um, so congratulations to the city of Etiquini um, for hosting uh, this conference. Uh, mine is going to be quite an interesting session, not that others went, um, because we have uh, quite, a, quite a, a fascinating topic to deal with. But before we go there, um, we also must thank the, the foundation that was set yesterday um, from the keynote speakers that have set the context, the leadership of UKZN by setting the context and creating linkages between issues of inclusivity at the city level and uh, the research um, uh, content of the university itself and how those should align. Um, our city manager of Etiquini by setting the context in terms of some of the struggles that the city of Etiquini is facing. And these, these challenges are not just exclusive to Etiquini alone. Um, in fact, they're not even exclusive to cities in the continent, but also they, are, they also affect other cities in, in the global south and even in the global north in terms of inclusions. Uh, so the content yesterday, the session yesterday dealt with the issues of uh, city informality and uninformality where they fascinate four fascinating conversations uh, that came across the country and the continent as well. Um, the, and then we moved to inclusive cities and built environment, which is a, a, a collective ideals as well uh, of um, everyone in society, including academia, uh, public, public sector, civil society. Today, we're going to go a bit deeper um, into the capacity of the state to achieve inclusive cities. Um, the speakers that I have today will dissect and unpack those issues around um, inclu um, inclusivity of cities and the capacity of the state. Um, there's various provocations that I hope we'll be able to deal with to firstly understand and ask questions around uh, whose state is it anyway. Um, and very often people confuse the state and government um, and government is just an institution within the state itself, but the state is much broader um, a, a, a formation and a formation that, um, that although supreme, uh, although it's a political association, but although supreme than, than any other uh, sort of formation um, in, in any country, um, it's important to understand what shapes the state's capacity. And the state capacity is not just the capacity of government, but it's a capacity of private sector, it's a capacity of local gov of, uh, of, of academia, it's capacity of civil society, the capacity of, um, of, of, of communities. In order for us to achieve inclusivity, we need to, to ensure that everyone um, is working towards these inclusion, in, in, inclusive ideals um, or in ideals of inclusion. Um, how do we make sure that happens? Um, and some of the provocations that I've always thrown back to my colleagues um, in academia is saying, we've got to depart from doing research um, that is tick box, that goes and sits in libraries and collect dust, but we must deal with issues that pertain to uh, the context where we work. Um, uh, UKZN should look very with the, uh, through a very clear lens um, and in a detailed way on how inclusive the city of Etiquini is, as an example, how the city of Johannesburg is as well, how cities in the continent are, and we must dissect that issue of, of, um, of inclusion to that, to that, to that level. So we're going to try and save your time and also respect your time and respect that you are here. Um, we're gonna have a few opening remarks and then we're gonna have three keynote speaker in your program in May say two, but we're going to have three keynote speaker, hopefully. Um, and then we will have question and engagement so you can engage with the speakers um, uh, on, on today's uh, conversation. 
what I'll try and do is not to read the obituaries of the keynote speakers. I'll just provide a very brief summary of who they are. Uh, if you want to read more, um, and I'm sure they have links on their on their social media pages on LinkedIn, and um, the organizing uh, committee will share their bios if you are interested on in knowing more about them. But I would like to respect your time um, and respect the speakers themselves so that I don't make them cringe while I read their obituaries. Um, to begin with, I'll start, I'll firstly check whether Prof. Um, uh, Natasha Potrite is in, is in this um, webinar now. Oh, okay, I can yes, see. She, Prof. Yes, she Prof. is. Yeah, Prof, I will want to hand it over to you for your welcoming remarks. Um, and thank you so much for joining in. Um, over to you, uh, uh, Prof. Potrite. Thank you. And good morning, everybody. I'm just trying to, to, to wangle because, you know, as usual, with admin, you are in 20 meetings at the same time. <laughs> so um, I want to really say good morning to all of you and welcome to the second Inclusive Cities Conference and particularly to this plenary session. I would like to congratulate the organizers and the sponsors of the second conference on Inclusive Cities, whose theme is the uh, capacity of the state to achieve inclusive cities. I would also like to express my profound gratitude to be part of this event. I'm speaking to you today, representing the University of Venda as the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Science, Engineering and Agriculture, and as and an active collaborator, collaborating partner of the conference and Sarchi Chair for Inclusive Cities since its inception. Thank you for reminding us that we all have a role to play in creating inclusive, safe and diverse spaces in our endeavors of the everyday. This is one of the key functional targets that the Sustainable Development Goal number 11 entitled Sustainable Cities and Communities seeks to achieve. We all need to make a deliberate effort to engender inclusive spaces through our day-to-day -day activities as researchers, academics, practitioners, and stakeholders alike. We may also need to further reflect on decolonizing the curriculum to ensure that it also provides for the so-called inclusiveness spaces for everyone. As the University of Venda, we are therefore delighted to contribute to this global agenda through partnering with the Saatchi Chair for Inclusive Cities, the School of the Built Environment and Development Studies, College of Humanities at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. I'm also delighted to note that our students and colleagues from the Department of Urban and Regional Planning, namely Professor James, Chaka Zira and Dr. Immaculate Ingwani were given critical roles to chair a session on the city of inform uh, informality and uh, informal and to lead the awards committee for the second Inclusive Cities Conference. In addition, I have further noticed that staff from University of Venda have co-authored and contributed four papers for colleagues from academia, industry, as well as students. The Faculty of Science, Engineering and Agriculture therefore looks forward to an extended collaboration beyond this conference on inclusive cities. Colleagues, as the Executive Dean here at the Faculty of Science, Engineering and Agriculture in Vinda University, in Vinda University, I'm really delighted to place my support to strengthen this collaboration that started way back in 2019. It shows that we are growing from strength to strength. With these few words and remarks, allow me to thank all and wish you the best in your deliberations in the remaining two days of the conference. I will await with keen interest for updates and feedbacks on the conference outcomes and resolutions. Once again, I say thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. Uh, Portskite, uh, for your for your kind words, and we do understand the chaos of uh, of having to run between meetings, uh, and we are specialists in that as as government. And I come from local government, so thank you so much for making time to be with us and um, for those welcoming remarks. Um, the as just the housekeeping issues there are there's a link on the chat uh, where you can register to the, to say that you've attended this session 
please do so. And I'll request the organizing team not to put the link on the room breakaway on the breakaway links yet. Could we do that? Because it becomes confusing. Can we do that once we do questions and answer before we break away rooms? And I request Sbonile Butelizi not to do that. Uh, let's put, um, let's have engagement on the chat that is related to these sessions so that we don't create challenges of people then clicking to those links and end up being lost in rooms that are empty. Um, the next uh, speaker is uh, Mr. Martin Lewis, who's an executive officer of, of SACPLAN, who's also going to give us a welcome, welcoming remarks. Uh, the program says Mr. Lewis Martin, but it's Martin Lewis, please, let's get that correct. Um, Mr. Um, uh, Mr. Lewis, over to you. Thank you very much, program director. Um, program uh, director, partners, keynote speakers, presenters, participants. It is a privilege to welcome you all to the second day of the second International Conference on Inclusive Cities. To the partners, the University of KwaZulu-Natal, the Saji Chair of Inclusive Cities, the Etukweni Municipality, the International Society of City and Regional Planners, the South African Cities Network, the National Research Foundation, the Journal of Inclusive Cities and Built Environment, the University of Johannesburg, to Mzuzu University, the University of Venda, and to SACPLAN. Thank you so much for this excellent platform where experiences and research can be shared and where we can learn from each other and through which we can continuously improve our personal and professional capacity. Yesterday, Professor Lovemore Chipungu in his opening address indicated that the state capacity emerges as the ability of the state to formulate and implement social, economic, and political goals. I would like to add to this. We as partners have an important role and the responsibility to ensure that we have a state that is capacitated to achieve inclusive cities. We as SACPLAN um, are tasked to ensure that institutions of higher education, such as the UKZN, the UJ and UNIVEN, offering urban and regional planning programs, produce graduates with the necessary competencies and skills. It is done through regular accreditation visits where these planning programs are evaluated. We have, however, not been working in isolation. It is also the responsibility of the state to ensure that when appointing personnel responsible for urban and regional planning functions, that appropriate qualified and registered persons are appointed to such positions. As SACPLAN, we had been and will continue to engage municipalities as well as provincial and national government departments to ensure that they appoint appropriately qualified and registered persons. It is through this that we will ensure that we have a capable state that is able to achieve inclusive cities. We will then have qualified and registered persons that can apply their knowledge and skills in the interest of humanity, of the public and of the environment, and to ensure that our natural and cultural environment is taken into account in planning decisions. To execute their work with competence, honesty, integrity, sincerity, and in accordance with general acceptable norms and professional conduct. That continuously improve their professional skills of those of themselves and their subordinates and their employees through conferences such as this one that they furiously and impartially exercise their independent professional judgment, that they discharge their duties to their employers, clients, colleagues, and others with due care and diligence in accordance with the provisions of codes of conduct of, of professional bodies, that strives towards the transformation of the profession in order to achieve the objectives of the constitution in bringing a non-racial society and open democracy and to comply with all applicable empowerment legislations and to promote social and environmental justice in the built environment. During yesterday's breakaway rooms, we had interesting thought-provoking presentations on the themes of city informality, uh, govern, governing women, ref, refugee and youth towards inclusion and inclusive cities and built environment. Today, we will be having presentations on themes, governance and institutions in promoting inclusivity, the inclusive planning ideology and processes and technology and data to promote inclusivity. We are looking forward to these presentations and I encourage participants to engage the presenters during these breakaway rooms. 
I thank you. And Mr. Lewis, thank you so much. I appreciate those remarks. And they are very provocative because they are beginning to dig deeper into the relationship between the state and academia um, in terms of what academia produces and whether the state is ready to receive it or whether what academia produces is what the state requires. Um, and I know SACPLAN is at pain to ensure that people that get employed to work in the state and do the functions that planners should be doing, it is actually planners that are accredited and supported by SACPLAN. So I think that is a very, very interesting provocation. Um, and I hope it is noted in the engagements later on. And thank you so much, Mr. Lewis, um, uh, once more. For the next welcoming address will come from uh, Professor Mulwafu from Zuzu University in Malawi. Prof, Prof Mulwafu, are you ready? Yes, I am. Welcome. Thank you. And morning, everyone. Um, let me uh, recognize the um, chairperson of the panel session, Dr. Sandy Rembata, CEO Sackplan, Executive Dean, Investor Vendor, keynote speaker, um, ladies and gentlemen. Um, well, I'm going to make, um, I'm going to speak on behalf of um, Zuzu University, um, which is a partner institution working on this, um, the issue of um, the capacity of the state to achieve inclusive cities. And um, let me start by saying that um, as a university, we, we have a strategic plan that seeks uh, to promote international uh, cooperation. And um, we do encourage uh, both our staff and students um, to have exchange uh, programs, but also um, to collaborate on research uh, project um, implementation and um, seeking uh, funding. And in this regard, we are pleased to report that um, our department of uh, the built environment has signed a memorandum of understanding with the Department of Town Planning and Housing at the University of KwaZulu-Natal uh, to collaborate on a research and postgraduate teaching. So this is um, very much in line with um, our aspiration in the strategic plan. And now coming to the topic of the conference. So, sorry, like Prof, to... can I disrupt you for a bit? So we would like to see your face if that's okay. Were you able to turn on your camera? Yes, yes, um, it's on. Okay, so it's not, yeah, it's not showing on our side. So I think there's there's a bit of a challenge there. So we, we should have, we forgot to check it a bit earlier. Um, I'm not yeah. seeing it on my end. No, we don't. Uh, we don't see him as well, but I think it's his network. It could be problem of network, but otherwise it's it's on. No, no, um, it's it's fine. It wouldn't, it wouldn't, the network wouldn't stop the camera from showing, but it's fine. Uh, Prof, let's go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Um, let me try maybe to fiddle around with the uh, system here to see if I can get it up. Um, all right. Um, I'll, I'll be jabbering, trying to uh, work on it as I, I speak. Um, right. Uh, so what I was saying that um, as far as the uh, theme of this conference is concerned, um, Malawi is implementing its uh, development uh, blueprint, um, the Malawi 2063, uh, within which urbanization is one of the key pillars. And the idea here is to promote urbanization. And so far, the government has identified uh, eight towns uh, proposed for development into secondary cities. And of course, it's not clear um, in, in terms of the capacity um, to implement or operationalize uh, this idea, but um, it is um, an important development that um, uh, we should take note of. And that um, as we're moving forward, um, really it will be very useful to see um, issues of uh, capacity, uh, human capacity, uh, financial resources, and others uh, if we are, we are going to successfully implement for the um, for the country. And so the other issue is that um, 
can we say that Malawi has the capacity to effectively implement inclusive cities? And we know that um, in the uh, Sustainable Development Goals um, 11, um, we need to make our cities um, as inclusive as possible, but also safe, resilient, and sustainable. And um, so um, for Malawi, this is an important aspect, as I said, that we need to assess the capacity um, if we can achieve this. Um, one of the issues also is to look at the urban and housing policies um, as they relate to um, the laws which were approved in 2016. And so far, the literature shows that as a nation, we have limited resources against the ever increasing urban population. And um, secondly, um, that they are exclusionally urban and housing policies that favor, uh, tend to favor the rich and the powerful. And in this situation, we either have to live with injustices or always be reminded through demonstrations and protests um, in various ways uh, by a section of the urban population that is unserved with basic services such as water, electricity, or even waste management. So um, what we're saying here is that um, we need to pay attention um, to those policies uh, that are exclusionary, that are not taking into account all the uh, population of the, our urban areas. Um, it is possible, of course, uh, to take advantage of the rapid urbanization um, that we can create opportunities if inclusive policies and strategies uh, become central to urban planning and management. So um, we can leverage on this opp opportunity. And um, in, in Malawi, where in our cities, we have over 70% of employment um, falling within the informal sector. Um, so the question that comes that, um, why should informality be criminalized? Um, we 70% of the population is in the informal sector, but that is not um, being uh, included at all. And in some cases is criminalized. So I think time has come uh, to look within and see how best uh, to promote rapid urbanization for inclusivity. And one way being to engage with various sectors and various actors in the informal sector to make them part of the urban economy through financial policy and legal support and move away from the usual rhetoric uh, from our uh, political players. Um, so um, plenary uh, session chair, um, at this point, um, let me take the opportunity on behalf of um, Zuzu University um, to really thank the organizers of the conference and uh, thanks to uh, Professor Hope for leading the inclusive cities research as well. And it is our wish that um, our collaboration will extend uh, to other universities so that we're able to work together and uh, for the uh, good of our cities. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much, Professor. I really appreciate uh, that welcoming remark, those welcoming remarks, and apologies for for the technological glitch. Um, we are bound to to face these as we we've been trying to learn over the past three years on how to engage <clears throat> via these technological tools, and sometimes they show us how powerful they can be um, in instances where we thought we are in, we think we're in control, um, but hopefully we'll be able to sort it out and we'll get to see you. Um, colleagues and ladies and gentlemen, please allow me to move to the next session now that we're done with our welcoming remarks. And, um, and again, uh, sincere gratitude to Professor Potkite, to Mr. Martin Lewis, um, and to Professor Mulwafu 
uh, was a DVC at Mzuz University for their welcoming remarks and really setting the scene um, in terms of in terms of where we are and what we want to discuss in relation to the capacity of the state. Now I'm going to move to the keynote lecture sessions. Um, I've got three um, brilliant speakers um, from three different parts of the world who are going to address us. Um, one is from Poland uh, in the coastal city of Gdansk. Um, and I'm going to have uh, Professor Rajendra Kumar from uh, one of the biggest cities in the world, New Delhi. And uh, I'm going to also have uh, Professor Kumanzanje uh, from Univen, uh, the University of Venda. Um, I hope I'm getting it correct, uh, Prof. I'm not sure where, where he currently is. He's also associated with the University of Zimbabwe. He may be in, in Zimbabwe or Harare. Um, so we'll, <clears throat> when, just to start, colleagues, as I said earlier on, I'm going to avoid reading um, Weber team, everything, uh, the bios of, of my keynote speakers, because I also don't want to waste too much of your time, but also I think I don't want them to cringe a lot while I introduce them, because these are the work that they've done over a long period of time, and I don't want them to feel like this is an obituary. So next up, we're going to have Professor Lawrence, who come from the coastal city of Gdansk in Poland, uh, who's at the University of Gdansk, um, University of Technology in Gdansk um, um, is, in, is in the Department of Urban Design and Regional Planning at the Faculty of Architect, um, of Architect where he's, uh, he, do, he does his teaching. Um, he does also a lot of research uh, around uh, professional issues that deal with issues of local identity, heritage within the urban transformation processes, shaping urban public spaces, systems, as well as dealing with socioeconomic and legal aspects of urban transformation. We will agree that this is important because issues of inclusion, we're not talking about people uh, just being included in the decision-making processes only, but it's how we design uh, our urban spaces to ensure that they include they are inclusive and they are accessible to everyone. Uh, without wasting too much time, I will into I will um, give the floor to Prof. Uh, Lauren. Prof. We didn't get the time to test your technology, but hopefully it will not defy us. Um, uh, do you do you want to start sharing your your presentation, please? Yes, thank you very much, dear colleagues, for um, inviting very, very much Dr. Mbata for uh, introducing me. It's very kind of you to mention all these affiliations and so on. Just on top of that, I want to say I'm also playing the role in practice since um, around three years. I'm playing the role of the Dansk City Architect. So I'm basically a director of the Office of the City Architecture at the Municipality of Gdansk. So I'm doing both in theory and in practice. So I hope that I will be able to share a little bit of the uh professional experiences as well and i hope you can hear me and see me clearly so this will be okay I'll, i'm gonna share my presentation in a minute uh but before we go to that uh, i would like to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me again for this uh, conference i'm very honored with this invitation and my special thanks go to professor uh, hangulani magidi misha uh who he, who has decided to invite me again for this for this event but also I would like to say hello to Mr. Martin Lewis, a very good friend of mine, uh, with whom we have been working on uh, the Isaac Arp Congress in Africa in Durban. Uh, but also to our dear friend, uh, Professor Raj Rajendra Kumar from India, who is also a good friend of mine. So basically, uh, planners are like a big international global family. And I'm super happy that this conference is another opportunity for, di for discussing various issues at this uh, at this scale. So uh, let me share my screen now. And um, uh, well, well, it is, sorry. Uh, oops. Okay. Uh, here we go. Okay. Yeah, here we go. Okay. And uh, uh, and actually, uh, just uh, I, let me ask for confirmation whether you can actually see the full presentation, the full screen. If you could please say you can, so just to make sure that we don't have any problems. Yes, with technology. yes, we yes we can, Prof. But we are seeing your version of the presentation, so the presenter view. But it, um, if you can make it bigger, and we just see one one slide because we okay. see. So I'm yeah. terribly sorry, but I think that this is uh, not so. Yeah. So the last one, like an hour, 
like a wine glass next to that zooming space would be better. Okay. Uh, just the, so just the... what we can do is we can just make it bigger. Okay. All Not right, necessarily. Yeah. Uh, if you see where you're zooming and they're making it bigger at the bottom, um, just next to at uh, the minus sign there, that, yes, that sign should give us the full. full yeah. View. So that's what the, this is what we get in the end. Okay. All right. Anyway, so uh, let me see now. Uh, Do we get this stuff? This is better. Thank this you. This is better. Okay, yeah, please, go ahead. sorry for that, you know, unfortunately online presentations have all the issues and problems and so on, but I'm super happy we have managed to uh, resolve that. So actually, when we speak about um, inclusive cities and actually city planning, you know, I mean, when we speak about city planning, it's a little bit general, more general thing, of course, than just focus on the inclusive cities. Now, uh, we actually talk about the different aspects of that. And one of the aspects is uh, actually what we plan, which is uh, what kind of city do we want to get? And uh, this is actually the answer to that question is included in the topic of the conference, which means uh, inclusive cities, right? We want to plan for the inclusive cities. But the problem is that we are not only talking about the concept, but also how to deliver it. And that's actually the thing which uh, in many cases is not that often discussed. We often focus on just the concept uh, and just issues associated with the concept. But not so often we discuss um, the issues associated with implementation or with the or with the delivery of the concept, and that's what actually I believe is the most important part of the whole of the whole story associated with that. As if we do not focus on the implementation, if we do not focus on the delivery, then uh, we actually might have problems with uh, uh, dealing with the concept, or the concept just remains in the area of so to speak general theory. So uh, I would actually like to speak about planning for inclusive cities. And uh, from that point of view, I would like to speak a little bit about uh, the concept, which has just recently been uh, discussed widely in the academic circles, but also in practice, uh, associated with so-called flexible planning, with uh, uh, planning that actually allows for, uh, so to speak, tailor-made solutions for the particular urban problems. Uh, associated not only with concept, but also with the particular situations. And I, of course, I don't have to say at the conference that actually uh, each side calls for the different issues and for the different solutions. Uh, in every case, uh, we are dealing with different set of problems or different contexts. I guess each and every one of us knows that very, very well. Uh, the problem is, is that um, our, so to speak, set of uh, planning tools is not allowing us in many cases to uh, answer to these problems in a proper way. So from that point of view, I would like to speak a little bit about, uh, uh, as I said, flexible planning for inclusive cities or for developing inclusive cities. Uh, but also, uh, I would like to focus a little bit about the local government experiences associated with including uh, different stakeholders in the process of discussion associated with the uh, public um, uh, 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 develop or with, with the development of uh, cities. So first of all, regarding the structure of the city, uh, well, of course, I'm speaking a little bit from the European perspective, uh, uh, but actually we all want to have a nice and cozy and uh, uh, good scale city, so to speak. In case of Europe, of course, we are interested in kind of traditional uh, heritage-based uh, urban structures, in case of Durban, it might be slightly different. Uh, a favorite picture of mine taken at, on, uh, at one of the Durban universities, uh, they have this big painting on the wall depicting the modern vision for, uh, for the future of downtown Durban. Uh, and that actually shows uh, uh, that the ideal of the, of the, of the future city might be, might be very different. The question is what actually will be the future of our cities and of course we do not know that i think and actually it might be something like that from the one of the science fiction movies actually uh showing us that in the end we might get uh, uh, something completely different from that what we are conceptualizing or from that what we are what we are or we were thinking about and uh, actually from that point of view I guess uh, it's a good recommendation that every planner watches a lot of the science fiction movies because it can actually allow us to conceptualize what could be actually the future of our cities 
uh, despite from that what we are actually thinking of and planning for. So from that point of view, we actually um, have to say that if we speak about um, uh, the inclusive cities, uh, we have to discuss, uh, as I mentioned at the very beginning of my of my presentation, uh, that we have to discuss uh, the tools and instruments which are which can actually help us in achieving this uh, concept or achieving this state of the of the inclusiveness. And of course, we have ongoing debate regarding the future of the cities, and we have all these. Uh, discussions regarding uh, what cities can look like, how they can work in the future. But um, as I mentioned, there is not so much of the discussion about how this vision shall be delivered and implemented. And again, let me repeat that. I think this is uh, one of the key issues which has to be discussed uh, uh, in, the, uh, in our planning uh, debate. And that actually calls also for more general question on the future of uh, planning as a profession what actually uh, kind of uh, profession uh, or professional skills do we need for uh, delivering, for achieving this desired state of the inclusiveness or for delivering the inclusive cities, but not only inclusive, I would say sustainable, uh, environmentally friendly and so on, right? So what kind of skills, what kind of planning skills do we need? How do we train our students? How do we develop professionally? in order to um, actually be able to deal with all these things. But also that actually calls for, an, uh, it, it provokes another question, uh, which means how the planning practice could potentially look like in future. And this is another thing which, uh, um, has, to be, which has to be uh, uh, discussed. So let me actually uh, say about the city of the future. As uh, you could see from those three introductory slides with all these pictures, the future of the cities can be hardly predicted. It depends on the number of the variables. And uh, quite recently, we have got uh, a new set of those, so like uh, the health issues, right? I mean, like three or four years ago, nobody could actually imagine that the global pandemic would completely change uh, the face of our cities. Uh, as far as I know, South Africa was hit uh, quite heavily by COVID. And uh, the same was here in Poland. Uh, in case of Gdansk, my, home, my hometown, we actually had uh, a lot of the issues and problems associated with uh, uh, this uh, unexpected development of, uh, of the global pandemic. But also there are economic issues, political issues, environmental concerns and environmental issues. So just to mention a couple of those that five or six years ago, we could not predict. And just let me not be that pessimistic, but I think that five years from now, we will have another set of issues and problems we will have to deal with. And we have we don't even know at the moment what kind of things these could be. So uh, we can say that the future of the cities will be shaped uh, by phenomena and uh, processes we are still not aware of. And we can say, I'm sorry to say that, we don't have a clue about the future of our cities, which means that uh, their shape cannot be defined on the basis of just simple extrapolation of the current state. So, of course, again, the science fiction uh, movie makers actually deliver us a number of the vision on the future of the cities like this one. This is the future of the future New York like 100 years from now. Uh, but of course, uh, this is just one of the predictions. It, can, it, it could look completely different. Just for information, when I uh, have been visiting the New York this year uh, in February, I was shocked with the a uh, very sad state of uh, of this uh, of this uh, of this beautiful city, and uh, how actually run down the entire structure was after the COVID uh, uh, after the COVID disaster. So from that point of view, as I said, uh, those new phenomena which we have to face uh, do not actually allow us to predict what the city could look like in the future. So how how can we plan this uh, future city? And my first statement is that we do not plan the city we, that we will have, because uh, uh, we have no idea what kind of city we will have, uh, but we should plan for the city we want to get. So if we want to get closer cities, we should plan for the social inclusion, we should plan for the economic inclusivity, and we should plan for the, uh, for the um, qualities that we want to achieve. And actually, uh, this planning uh, should be based on the two different set of concepts regarding, first of all, our ideas associated with the ideal or must-have 
uh, features of urban space, but also on tools and instruments allowing their successful implementation. I would say tools and instruments are especially important in that particular case, because as I said again, uh, if we do not focus on implementation, then we are just talking theory or we are just talking dreams. And that's not what we want. And of course, uh, uh, schools of architecture and schools of planners are full of uh, concepts associated with the future of the cities. What kind of sector do you want to get? The question is how to deal with that. So that actually calls for the redefinition of the nature of planning. And actually, uh, we were trained uh, uh, for the reality that actually planning is based on the set of rigid ideas regarding ideal city coming from certain concepts which are adopted by elites, selected professionals, and so on. And that's actually what modern uh, and also to some extent postmodern uh, urban development paradigm were based on. We actually were dealing with uh, a number of the different uh, concepts and issues that uh, we were just supposed to implement. But actually, uh, uh, we have to understand that planning nowadays is not about uh, those rigid ideas, but it's more about um, developing a social political process uh, within which uh, commonly accepted concepts and ideas are translated into spatial decisions. So that actually calls into question to what extent, in example, sustainable development goals are based on, uh, on uh, the commonly understood needs of the particular societies. Uh, my point is that those general recommendations definitely have to be translated into the uh, spatial decisions which are locally based and which are uh, deeply rooted in the local problems and issues which are different in Durban, which are different in Zimbabwe, which are different in India, which are different in Poland, in China, in US and so on. And actually, there is no single environment that actually uh, can be uh, based on that. So that means actually we need to reinvent to some extent our planning philosophy. And um, of course, we have a lot of the classic approaches uh, uh, which actually call for the uh, uh, for using and uh, utilizing the declarations and manifestos which we all know about. Okay, I, I mean, like the plan theory is full of those, uh, but uh, actually, when we talk about uh, this approach, which is uh, locally based, so to speak, uh, we should uh, define the good priorities for our common future. Uh, which go beyond the classic approaches. And we have to say that these ideas and practice are subject to constant change, depending on site, situation, and context, and also positions of the particular stakeholders. Again, let me refer to the Durban example, uh, when uh, we were not only facing, uh, facing the issues associated with the outcomes of the COVID pandemic and all the outcomes associated with that, but we are also dealing with the issues associated with the uh, tragic floods, which took place a couple of uh, uh, months ago. Uh, but also uh, we had to deal with uh, the other issues, like in example, infrastructure um, issues and, uh, ele and electricity supply uh, problems, which uh, uh, started to appear in, um, as we know, all around South Africa, just to mention that, uh, uh, that thing. So basically, uh, this uh, uh, side situation and context definitely call for the redefinition of uh, of uh, uh, of our priorities, so to speak. And from that point of view, uh, we also have to define who are the stakeholders and how the whole thing is actually dealt with. So we can say that from this uh, general overview of the situation that we can see at the moment, we have to understand that this uh, rigid planning based on defining the final structure of the city is just a song of the past, okay? We are not there anymore. And um, uh, our planning has to be redefined from that point of view. A state regulated planning law in many cases just do not respond to the dynamically changing ideas of the society. And also there is an increasing variety of problems and issues we deal with uh, uh, and actually this calls for the very diversified approaches to particular sites and problems, including um, the usage of the much greater palette of tools and techniques just to deliver projects like this. This is a project in London, the King's Cross project uh, that had to be developed uh, and delivered uh, in uh, um, a very, I would say, uncommon way. 
so uh, what we need is a kind of elastic or flexible planning. Uh, Charles Sandra calls this elastic planning. I would prefer flexible planning, uh, but uh, it actually is associated with numerous theories and concepts regarding uh, the shaping the city and how to deal with that in the different situations. But also, this is about uh, uh, inclusiveness. The, this is about including diversified groups of stakeholders, not only just community, we have to understand, uh, but, but that also includes institutional stakeholders. It also includes uh, uh, business uh, stakeholders. It also includes uh, different authorities and uh, um, other representatives of the different public uh, sector and so on, um, uh, just in order to be part of the solving planning problems. And that means that actually uh, the main focus on our in our planning workshop actually is uh, is public participation and stakeholders involvement, but involvement of all possible stakeholders. Uh, it's actually moving from structure planning to action planning to defining action that have to be uh, undertaken and uh, moving from shaping regulations towards shaping visions and concepts that can uh, catch our hearts and souls and actually uh, that can be later on subject of the further uh, discussion. So on that basis, we can say that we should deal with uh, a number of the types of instruments that can be used related to planning, implementation, finances, organization, support, legal aspects, and all the other things associated with that, that in the end shall lead to the successful implementation of the given concept. You know, just an example of the planning workshop that we are discussing the particular concepts uh, associated with the particular site. Now, the problem is legislation, okay? The problem is that in each of our countries, we have a kind of still rigid and to, not, to some extent inefficient system of planning. Same is in Poland. Uh, the problem is it's like a dinosaur, okay? I mean, if uh, the dinosaur has to walk the tail, you know, it takes forever, basically speaking, right? The same is with planning. If you are supposed to, uh, to respond to, the, to, to some kind of burning problem, it usually takes months, if not years, to do that. But once we take any action, you know, the problem is gone usually, or, the, or, the, or there are different problems which we still have to deal with. So uh, at the same time, uh, we are facing an, uh, some attempts towards making planning more comprehensive and uh, flexible. So uh, this is a little bit contradictory, actually, because we are either comprehensive or flexible. Uh, then it's about uh, improving uh, position of public participation and stakeholders improvement. But also it's about uh, uh, developing new types of planning instruments. And that actually um, uh, uh, is associated with the new philosophy based on the on this quote that all that is not forbidden is allowed, which means uh, if something is some kind of the planning uh, activity is not forbidden, it should be allowed and it should be used in practice just in order to broaden this palette of the possible instruments that we are using in our planning practice. And we also have to understand uh, that we are doing that not just because we want to go broader, but because the, the traditional planning approaches are just not efficient enough in the current realities. So we have to invent or reinvent or rediscover to some extent new or renewed planning instruments and approaches like master planning, an example, which could be uh, used uh, from that point of view. Of course, there are different scales from citywide to site related. There are different approaches associated with master planning, shaping urban development concepts, developing urban development guidelines, running participatory processes, organizing various types of workshops and competitions, and so on. So we have quite a few of the different um, of the different um, approaches possible, but also that actually is associated with different um, outcomes. When we are creating input for shaping the statutory planning instruments. Uh, we are defining basis for conscious land management and defining ideas regarding various types of investment projects, which uh, can include also uh, projects which are based on the people's choices and the people's decisions associated with the future of the given site. And uh, in Gdansk, we have actually organized a special conference on flexible planning, which took place in December last year. 
Uh, if you actually want, you can uh, go to the website of the Gdansk City Architect and uh, you can actually uh, uh, go um, and, and actually listen to that. I mean, we have the full recording available of this particular conference uh, here with a banner from that what we did. But I, I mean, at the end of my presentation, I'd like to invite you for another event, which is taking place in November. And I'm super happy to say that Professor Hangulani Magidimisha initially agreed to participate in our event in November. Uh, she will be one of the speakers at our event, but I'm going to speak a little bit about that um, uh, in a few minutes. So uh, if timing still allows, let me uh, just uh, present a couple of the examples from the experience of the Gdansk City Architects Office that I'm running uh, that we are dealing with. So first is the, uh, so actually of uh, some of the examples which are dealing with this new approach to planning, uh, going beyond the just traditional statutory or structure planning. The first is the redevelopment study for the Grunwaldska Avenue Belt, which is like a major um, uh, spine, transportation spine of our city in case of Gdansk. Uh, when we are actually discussing the future of more than 30 sites, uh, on the basis of the transit-oriented development philosophy. And this future is actually associated with uh, uh, more than 20 uh, uh, requests from the developers and landowners associated with the redevelopment of their sites. The idea is to not to allow just uh, uh, the development as it is, but the idea is to restructure this entire part of the city um, in discussion with the local communities, with the uh, city council with uh, uh, these investors and landowners, but also with um, all other interested parties, just in order to reach the consensus regarding the uh, future of that particular site. Another uh, good example was uh, shaping the new development concept for entrance to our beach area. It's not as beautiful as in Durban, uh, but still um, uh, we have been discussing that with not only the site owners and potential investors, but the idea was to discuss uh, uh, that with uh, uh, potential uh, future users and the potential future uh, um, uh, uh, parts of the community, which are part of the whole of the whole story. Then uh, we have been discussing uh, the new development along the new tram line, which is supposed to be constructed in Gdansk. We have been dealing with the master planning of the new city district, but also with the tram transformation of the uh, city center uh, west front, so to speak. Uh, which uh, uh, which uh, uh, is actually right now dominated by the transportation infrastructure. And last but not least, this is about redevelopment of the uh, main brownfield site in the Gdansk city center, which is associated with uh, so-called the Young City area, which is a former shipyard and the former industrial site. So some conclusions. Uh, Planning needs to be flexible, both in terms of techniques and methods and final form of documents or solutions. This is the main message which I would like uh, to deliver during my short presentation. Secondly, legal framework for that still needs to be worked out. It cannot be based on that uh, what it was. And the practice is already there. We just need to expand it. We just need to uh, understand it and actually use it more uh, broadly. So let me invite you to Gdansk on uh, to another conference on transforming cities. It's 6 and 7 of uh, November. It's on the eve of the World Town Planning Day. So just as a teaser, here is a picture of our of our skyline. So if you want to see it in uh, in, in the foggy fall, you are more than welcome to come over. It's a little bit colder than South Africa at that time, but uh, I hope you do not mind. Uh, so uh, here is a banner for that. So um, uh, if you would like, uh, you are more than welcome. So thank you very much, Dr. Mbata, for um, inviting me. I hope I'm, I've not gone over time. If I did, I'm super sorry about that. Thank you so much. Uh, Prof. Lauren, thank you so much. Really appreciate you have not gone over time. In fact, you, you've you done a, a brilliant job in being extremely provocative and uh, your provocation is is seen uh, through the comments that are coming out on the chat uh, where the planners are shivering now because you are saying that the city of the future cannot be predicted and uh, planners think they can. 
but also you are saying that they will be shaped by by they will be sh uh, shaped by phenomena and processes uh, that are not yet defined, um, and very often we want to look at 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 what has happened before in order for us to plan going forward. But also you're saying you can't we can't plan for the city we will have, but we'll plan the city for the city uh, we want to have. There's quite a number of really really provocative presentations that you've you've given us, and you've given us a lot of food for thought, and I hope that. The planning profession um, and uh, the state itself takes these questions extremely seriously um, in their collaboration to build the cities uh, that that we need. And and you you reminded me of of my of my experiences with the two really wonderful cities in Poland, um, which which went against completely my expectation of what Polish cities would look like. Uh, Krakowice. Um, um, uh, Katowice is an example um, and what you would have in your head on what Katowice would look like and going to a very idyllic, idyllic um, more romantic little town of Krakow. I don't know whether it's right to call it town, it could be bigger. Um, to think of planning in that spaces, could one have predicted that these sort of old towns will all of a sudden become a center of attraction for, for, for European population? Um, and how those link those cities link to villages of Zakopane, which in itself is becoming a city village, um, and the planning around the activities that are happening um, in in that part of Poland. Um, Prof, thank you so much, and hopefully you will stay um, and and uh, deal with some of the questions that are coming up on the chat. And I'm 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 extracting some of these questions, and I know the organizing committee, the organizing team will like them to be put on on the q a session of the of of the um, of the zoom um which is a bit challenging i guess for some to be able to put it there so if you put it on the chat that's fine and i encourage people to engage with the speaker through the chat as uh, through those questions because we want to make it a bit active and unfortunately the organizers invited me and i dislike boring conferences and very often academic conferences do borderline boring so because they don't really create that kind of engagement because they're too theoretical but this session is really really wonderful and thank you so much prof once again for taking the time and being extremely extremely provocative in your in your in your presentation we want to take a breathe a, a, a two second breather and then we'll move to Delhi um another um a wonderful space for for a lot of lessons that we can learn um in terms of uh, cities and how we can plan cities going forward as promised again uh, uh prof kumar i'm not going to read your obituary uh, Prof Kumar is an architect, a curator, um, and is awarded the most admired education influencer in India in 2022, and a global educational influencer in 2020. Um, and before that, in 2019, he was, uh, which was already a telltale of where he will end up. He was an Indian Young Achievers Award in 2019 in 2009 um, and he's since done quite a lot of work around the space of architecture and cities. Um, Prof Kumar, I'm going to give you an opportunity to take the floor. Uh, we are doing very well on time, which is part of the respect that I want to bring to our, uh, to our um, uh, attendees and participants in this webinar. So we don't want to go over time. We want to keep it uh, within the time. And that's why I'm encouraging people to put in the questions already so that when we go to the questionnaire format, uh, we'll be able to, um, uh, to be quick in that process. But also I encourage you to engage with our speakers uh, directly as well through the Q&A um, uh, space. Uh, they will be answering the questions as when they are done uh, with their presentation. Prof Kumar, over to you. Thank you so much, Professor. It has been a wonderful, wonderful listening, my dear friend, uh, Piotr. And, you know, it's always, I mean, I also have a great experience of visiting his city, such a beautiful city, what Gadans is. And I hope that, Professor Piotr, uh, to see you again sometime in November and then before also in uh, some other occasion. So, yeah. Uh, so I'll keep my time. I mean, yeah, um, well, uh, I'm an architect uh, based in Delhi. And uh, before that, uh, before talking about my city, I would just like to tell you one small uh, joke in city what floats around. I'll, I'll say in Hindi, but I'll translate in, in English also. In Hindi, it says, uh, jisne jisne kiya hai paap, Delhi aega apne aap. So it goes in, in English like this. Anybody who has done 
sin in their past life, they will come automatically to live in Delhi. So, you know, Delhi is a mega city. I mean, it is the city of, uh, I mean, uh, 20 million. And I mean, that's a, that's, a city, that's only the city core. I mean, if you talk about, you know, the, the periphery city, it goes, I mean, almost a double double of the population. So, so I'm talking of a double of a population of a 20 million. So, so you can you can imagine the scale of the city. So there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of experimentation of uh, urbanism and planning happens in Delhi. I mean, some some failed, some successful. So I'm going to take you through some of the example of uh, different cities of India and some of the examples which I've been talking about uh, fragile urban governance and then how about the city and state. When I'm saying state, it's about, I'm talking about um, uh, governance. And then I'm also going to talk about the ephemeral urbanism and impermanent population. Where I'm talking about impermanent population, I'm talking about immigrants. So, so these are the these are the five core issues which I will be uh, you know trying to touch. I mean, though because of the the scarcity of the time, I may not be able to go uh, you know as in detail. But as as uh, organizer said, I I'll be very happy to answer the questions. Uh, well, uh, as I mean, I have been, uh, last year I um, uh, I was awarded as a global uh, India's global influencer award and before that uh, uh, a global influencer award in 2020 so these uh, I'm very much into actively involved in academics and also in the practice I, I believe that this is where we imagine our city core we imagine our I mean everybody loves nature and everybody is uh, is uh, very you know they always have a very uh, desire for being close so this is the the in, this is the image of a, of a, a very central city core of a mega city and i if the next slide which is going to come and i'm i'm sure that it, it is going to shock you so this is the our core city so this is a central park uh, in new york so does uh, does our core cities green sh be like this or we should rethink in a different way. So this is how the people are moving. The people are moving from one place to another place. I mean, the immigration is the is a very very major concern for all the global cities, whether immigration from within the country or a global immigration because of the war or because of of uh, any other reason. So is the city moving like this? So these are the core issues which are which are always you know uh, close to my heart and. I, in my academic research or in my practice, I always try to touch the city and citizens always there. So today's we are living in in the in the war time. I mean, and I'm very sure that you know my friend uh, uh, Piotr and you know the the Poland country is highly affected because of the the immigration coming from. Uh, because of the war or or because of any other reasons so the people from the historical time people keeps on moving so every time i mean i i live in delhi but i'm not from delhi i mean i come from a small town in chandigarh and then before that in another small town in lucknow so uh, people moving so i'll be uh, uh, you know i'll be a little bit faster in some of uh, skipping of my slides so my only i wanted to to pass the message on. So how the, you know, how our cities are designed. I mean, Piotr has said a very important point about fragility about of planning. I mean, we cannot predict how our future cities is going to be. Today, today uh, we are, you know, uh, thinking of, you know, a technology type of A, but maybe uh, within a year, the technology level goes, I mean, Z, X, Y, Z, anywhere. So we can't predict that how the technology will move. So the cities need to be designed in a layer and there should be always a flexibility of, uh, of some surprises to come in the in terms of technology or in terms of uh, you know the, the, any other um, uh, calamity also like uh, nobody knew that covid is going uh, going to come i mean so imagine for 10 years back when the sdgs plan sdgs plan and all so nobody even thought of that you know the you know this pandemic like a covid will come so everything need to relook again so so how the layering of the city the our the cities are you know being designed you know keeping into consideration of a residential or you know in or or, or for that matter infrastructure and also there is a, a dislinkages 
in uh, and, and the you know the physical planning of the cities it's not only in mega cities even it is happening also you know in smaller cities also smaller town smaller villages also you know so there is a disintegration of infrastructure and you know the basic need uh, if uh, recently i was in london i mean a month back uh, so uh, so i always you know share uh, this slide in the terms that if you if you delete this part of this building, I mean, uh, Gherkin Tower of Foster, then this city of London will be, you, you can tell that any, any city looks the same. But here, you know, because of the Gherkin Tower of London and then the Shard also, you know, these kind of, a, these kind of iconic landmark create a, you know, new identity of the city. So I always say that architecture and a planner have a very strong role for defining the, the city's, you know, um, signature or, 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 or the iconism of, of city. So, you know, the verticality is, 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 the new, is the new trend which is going on. And I'm not against about verticalities, but again, you know, at cost of what? The verticality at the cost of, you know, there is always, uh, there is always, um, you know, uh, statement comes that verticality is because of, you know, there is a shortage of uh, land, yes. It's true, but you know the verticality is also on the cost of ecological, which I am against of. So yeah, so so um, you know the, there are a lot of global vertical cities which are coming up now. The vertical city planning is is a new mantra for any global cities. Uh, prior to that, you know, when you talk about a London example of Gherkin Tower, there the, the verticality was actually because of the iconism of the city. Here, the verticality is, is I mean, it's a new identity. And I, I believe that there is nothing wrong in it. But, you know, on the cost of eco ecological um, uh, disbalance, I'm, I'm against uh, that verticality. So here, you know, this verticality, so if you go, I mean, if you talk about Burj Khalifa Tower here, you know, almost a, li a little bit uh, less than half of, of the vertical, uh, of the height of the building are actually uh, empty space or, you know, just to uh, to reach of, of that particular height. So, so there is a very strong message coming out of this verticality trend. It's, it's it's like you know showing the uh, you know you know a kind of a, a identity. Every every city is going for the tallest, biggest, largest, you know that kind of a thing. So there so there is nothing wrong in it. I believe that Burj Khalifa is a very good example about you know putting up Dubai on a, another another level of a global map. But at the same time, we should be also sensible to our ecology. So uh, yeah, so so yeah. I mean, this is the example of. Uh, uh, Burj uh, uh, Arab Dubai because of the Burj Khalifa. Uh, before Burj Khalifa, you know, the Burj Arab Dubai was the identity of of uh, Dubai. But you know, there is a lot of uh, mimic uh, repetition of Burj Khali uh, Burj Arab here. So, so this is a very small Burj Arab in one of the small city in India. I mean, so so that that's what what my point is that architecture has a very strong you know, uh, power of identifying and influencing the cities, not only small cities or even for the bigger cities. Here we, here we talk about, uh, this is the image, a uh, two very, very interesting image of a Delhi city road. I mean, here you can see the Delhi city has a, has, has a, a passage for, you know, this kind of unorganized traffic or, you know, the, the sudden traffic. And here, this is also called organized traffic also. So, so I mean, uh, uh, you know, uh, Global South has a, these kind of a surprise element which are very different than you know the European um, um, uh, model of the city uh, here I mean you can see I mean and all the traffic jam there is after traffic jam there are a lot of memes comes which is uh, which is okay because of the technology this this is going to I mean change the entire way of our communication this is here it says that you know uh, the, the delivery is some uh, I mean the, the pizza delivery happens in so and so cars so these kind of uh, memes keep on coming in in our city soon after this this traffic mess and I believe uh, you know this uh, whenever ma any any master planners or any city planner or any city the uh, city um, stakeholders uh, talk about city and I believe that traffic is the biggest you know a challenge for any for any city here this is the this is the 10 year old image of my house here this is my younger son and he 
he recreate the traffic in the city you can imagine you know so so our what is our future future generations are you know learning so so this this is a, a image of close to my heart and i always use this image in my presentation that you know we have a responsibility to our, our future generations what i think and what i say that is all that is a big biggest uh, problem you know whatever we have our ideas and planning uh, you know for, for our ideas we should put it and we should be very vocal in the cities i have been always vocal on a, all, all global uh, forum and all and I, I hope that i will be joining my friend piotr royce again in in november if he invites me uh, so yeah so, so we need to be vocal we need to be also you know very sensitive whatever way of way we can contribute i am very sens uh, sensitive toward the issues of climate and sustainability in my all work i have been also doing a lot of uh, uh, global initiatives of you know working uh, you know uh with the with the international stakeholder this is one of the projects which which we did in new york at columbia university and indian uh, uh, indian consulate in new york which we did i mean we 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 had a, like a delegation of indian architects to new york and we we tried to learn from the from the example of a new york cities and also we also shared the our example to new yorkers uh talking about mumbai this is the this is the first image when when you talk about mumbai when you google about mumbai this this will come the first image the mumbai is a big mega city but mumbai is also this so there is a, there is a mix of you know this unorganized slums and you know this um this uh, you know this uh, you know uh, we call it a kacha makan so so kacha makan is a is a is a temporary shelter so temporary shelter and you know the big big mega structure goes hand in hand here here you can see you know always you know whenever if you have a this any new development there is a parallel development of this uh, this temporary shelter also happens so here you can see i mean how uh, you know this disconnect of you know this permanent shelter and uh, and uh, and temporary shelters happen so here is a, the uh, i mean i'm hinting the link uh, dislinkages of you know the you know the sensible planning also uh, here you here i mean this picture clearly shows that all this all the all this permanent housing which are there here you know the very sensitive issues happen that in these housings in these housings wherever i mean this this is a image of mumbai city but this can be image of any any mega cities of of uh, global south you know all the all the worker classes of of uh, you know the worker class means your driver your maid your servant and all they are who are serving in in these housings they they live here so because you know the the proximity of uh, you know the your working class people should not be very far and they cannot afford a, you know this uh, a mega structure and these kind of expensive housing so they live nearby so so uh, so as a trend in uh, in a many uh, global south mega cities that whenever if any new development happening of you know this organized new development when i'm talking about a mega housing there is always after few year there will be always a slum nearby because all this mega mega structure mega housings and all those things their working class people have to live nearby and you know this mega mega structure and you know these housing doesn't provide a housing for these working class people so that is a, one of the very serious concern in in our indian cities and i'm i'm working on you know some of the issues of you know overcoming of such kind of uh, issues uh, so that you know the the planet can already uh, uh, already um, integrate these issues in in, the, in their policies you know a, a project which is a, a, another iconic project so we which we are predicting that you know there will be a slum nearby you know here, here this is the one of the largest slum of asia is is called dharavi so now the, the dharavi is undergoing a, a makeover i mean i encourage everyone to google about this uh, this slum this is one of the best case study example of any urban planners if if they want to do a study on you know how to integrate uh, slum into a new newer development you know indians are very creative we always call we always call it i mean we will live in 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 um uh uh limitations so we all we try to find innovative solutions here i mean we are also very creative i mean we 
in, in whatever a limited capacity we have done it. I mean, these, these are not my project. These are, I'm just, you know, trying to show you how the, you know, the creativity can be also part of, uh, you know, this thing. This is one of the very interesting research which we, which we have been involved is that about, you know, this megapolis and, you know, the concern about traffic. So here, here you can see, these are the local trains, you know, the local trains, when, you, when I'm saying local trains, it's, a, it's a like, a, you know, uh, our global south, uh, glo global west cities have uh, this metropolis, you know, so, sorry, uh, underground metros and all. So now the major, major, major elephant in the city is the, is the traffic. And I believe that is going to be the bigger, biggest challenge for for any uh, any planners of any any cities even smaller or bigger cities so the car how to to come uh, the issues of car about you know the uh, uh, you know this decreasing of of car in the city so i believe that mumbai is one of the greatest example of you know how the car should be reduced and still i mean you know this is you you imagine if this is the this is the situation where everybody go to the office in the morning and come back in the evening. So that is the, is the challenge. So there is a millionaire uh, street, I mean, a, a millionaire street in, in Delhi, where all the people who are billionaire and all, but there is also a street, I mean, along the railway track, there are people living. So so for them, for them, this is the playground, which is a, a live railway track. So these are the, these are the, you know, the disparity in, uh, in the in the cities uh, about about people so this is here you know this is um, on on the uh, bank of the sea and you know how uh, dangerous to live in this so these are the issues which i always encourage in my academic also to be sensitive for for younger generation about to be sensitive about these issues are also there the issues are not only these fancy images this fancy architecture but but these fancy uh, buildings here again this is a marina bay sand uh, a building in uh, singapore i mean a very very interesting building which i always you know uh, admire of but at the same time there is also a copy of uh, this thing so so that is somehow good but again you know you know what what works in singapore may not work in india so i believe that that is you know the contextualization of you know the the, the local is is a need of ours i mean there are a lot of inspiration there are a lot of interesting building in in india i mean this is one of the very interesting building of uh, mm -hmm. In India, it's called Lotus Temple. Uh, it was inspired by Lotus, and you know, this is a new opera house, and you know, also again the same inspiration follows in and uh, this thing. This is again a very iconic building in and um, Dubai. I mean, this frame, and so so why I'm showing you this interesting example as an architect, we have a, like a great power to influence the city, which brings up good definitely. I mean, uh, which brings the economical aspect of uh, tourism or investment. That's also good, but at the same time, it should be also you know we need to be ecologically sensitive. And I believe that Dubai is a, one of the good example that Dubai has learned a lot in last few years. Of, with their with their mistakes and i believe that you know last uh, the world expo and you know this cop 28 which is again happening in uh, dubai um, in, in in the month of november and and it shows about their their sensitivity to toward ecology toward ecology and toward uh, you know the sustainability and i believe that dubai has a lot of new things to learn uh, again this is a uh, uh, project in uh, Central Park in New York, uh, this pencil tower, I, I believe that these kind of uh, things are iconism wise good, but at the same time, we should be also sensitive. Uh, this, this example, I'm not talking about this London tower where, where this, the, I mean, Vanky Tower is one of the tower where the, because of the reflection of sunlight and parked, I mean, one Jaguar car was parked and the car, the car was maintained. So this building was demolished. So these are the, they, there are enough examples about the sensitivity toward uh, architecture. This is, uh, I, I think uh, I need to be a little bit faster. This is one of the incident which happened that, you know, the heap of garbage collapsed and two people died who were walking, uh, who, who were driving on the street. Uh, and so, so, so they, I mean, the nature is, the nature is, you know, warning you, if we don't get up, uh, 
we we need to uh, i mean we need to we learn from our mistake and i and i believe that after covid there is a lot of awareness about you know the uh, awareness uh, uh, regarding uh, you know the sensitivity to what ecology is there so uh, i think i and i need to stop between because this is the smart cities which we have i mean working on 100 smart cities project of of india and I, and you know this smart cities is 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 a good example but again here we have talk about migration there is a I many smart city might work for technologically uh, it's it's a great it's a, it's a great i mean it's a great idea but i believe that a basic limitations about a smart cities is I mean, uh, for a, for a city like India, I I think there is a, a much more thing to do before going for a smart city. And I, I think I will stop here because I'm just I I can see that I I'm crossing my 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 time. And thank you so much. And you know, I'm I'm sorry. I'll uh, uh, just keeping in uh, the time of time question. I'll stop myself. Prof Kumar, thank you so much. You are right on cue. So it's not you haven't really taken more than you've been allocated. Uh, for that, I thank you. Uh, going back to your first joke about you must have seen to live in in Delhi. I thought it would be it would be it would be um, uh, Mumbai. Uh, because uh, Bombay, because I had read the Shantaram, and and the book takes you through uh, some of the of the most um, uh, exciting and yet challenging spaces um, in in Bombay, and you think to yourself, um, um, what happens in that city? Those who live there in everyday on everyday life, but also you make quite a um, really interesting provocation around verticality and uh, where you're invoking the Locopasia and saying, well, yes, we can follow in the footsteps of the Locopasia, but if verticality uh, sort of perpetuates or disrespects the ecological uh, sustainability um, or agenda that we want to achieve, then it doesn't make sense. We don't go verticality and not to uh, just for the sake of it. So we, you know, we will have a skyscraper, but if verticality is used um, to to support ecological sustainability, then we are talking about about the inclusive future that we want to see. But also, I, I do like the 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 cities of contrast, and and then it's something that we see a lot in this country. And if you've been in South Africa, to see how you know Kailisha and the central Cape Town is very different, or Inyanga, or Township of Inyanga, and Cape Town is different. And you'll find the same in Dar es Salaam. You'll find the same in Nairobi. You'll find the same in some of the cities in West Africa and Latin America, these cities of contrast, how do we deal with those issues um, in terms of balancing the two? Um, you also make something that hit, really hit home for us because we talk a lot of the development and I'm saying us, and I mean us as local government, particularly in South Africa, where we have these developments, these mega developments uh, that, are, that demonstrate heavy investment by the capital and very little investment on low income housing and the cheap labor that feeds um, those those mega investments and we have an invest a, a, a big development happening up in the in the west part of of Durban called West Town. If you look around West Town, there's very few, if at all, uh, low income um, housing or provision for people to live there. So you can almost predict that in the next few years there's going to be a proliferation of informal settlement in those kind of spaces because um, they require that kind of labor to to drive the development and to support the development. So that's been quite a quite a provocation, and I like how you've ended with the cities of creativity. That yes, we see these challenges, but um, cities in India are demonstrating that and. Cities is everywhere in the continent in, in Africa as well are demonstrating that um, the low-income people are very creative people and cities are spaces of creativity. How do we support their creativity in an inclusive manner uh, so people are not forced to creativity in order to escape uh, being excluded so that they find ways to exclude them, to include themselves. So absolutely fantastic presentation, Prof Kumar. Thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Hopefully you'll still be able to stay with us um, and answer some of the questions that are coming through um, as I've encouraged the participant to, participants to, um, uh, to throw in some of the questions on the chat. Um, please engage with us keynote speakers, colleagues, um, ask questions, connect with them if you haven't connected with them, uh, because we hope that this conference is a space is, is a space of connection and we don't let the visuality of it um, deprive us of that ability to network and connect. Um, thank you, Prof Rajan, once again.
Um, we now move to our last keynote speaker. On the program, you'll see that there is no um, space for, for, for the third keynote, but we'll, we will take the next 25 minutes with uh, Prof. Uh, Kumanzanje, who is, he will tell us where he is, but I'm assuming he's in a really idyllic and beautiful place there where he's invited us to, to come for the next uh, conference. Uh, Prof has over 30 years of experience in development. He balances um, uh, his experience in terms of regional development, rural development, um, and urban development um, as a practitioner. He finds a way to weave together the ideals of urban planning, uh, social development, community development, uh, inclusive housing, because those are all, they all belong um into in, in a space of um of urban planning and urban design that is inclusive a prof is also a member of zimbabwe institute of regional planners and regional and urban planners um, he is working with international consulting alliance and the spring international development association of planners but prof as i've promised i'm not going to read any of your obituaries so i'll really cut it um, uh, at the very top and encourage those who want to connect and read more about the great work you guys have done to connect on LinkedIn, uh, to connect via your email and on the chat. Uh, without further ado, uh, Prof um, Kumanzanje, do you want to um, uh, take the stage, please? Okay, so thank you so much, Doc. Um, I'm sorry for, for get crushing your program as it were, but... <laughs> Um, so thank you so much. I also want to thank the organizers who gave me the opportunity to be part of this very important uh, engagement. Um, so I also want to go through the, the, the same channel that my two previous presenters have made to try and visit each other people, each other's cities. So Dr. Prof. Rajendra, I will be in Delhi in November, so I hope that we can, uh, we can link up um, and then we can see how to move forward. So let me just... Um, project my screen and I would also request that you can confirm that you can see the the, the screen. Um, yes, we can, Prof. Please okay, so thank you so much. So what I want to do is, uh, I think my my, 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 my co-key uh, speakers have, have touched on the hard way of, uh, of, of inclusivity. I want to try and go the other way um, to touch on the on, on the on the software um, and when I was reflecting on this I was saying to myself I think one of the things that we also have to do is just to try and understand some of the barriers that um, that 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 hinder us to from achieving inclusivity um, and Doc, but I think you also took the words out of my mouth um, because I I thought that it would be important for the purposes of this paper to define what the state is and I agree entirely with you that it's about the institutions. And you've rightly mentioned that government is one of those institutions. But you also spoke about the private sector, the civil sector, uh, the civil society sector, and also the research uses academia. I also know that the, the state is also the people. So you've got different socioeconomic cultural groups. You have the poor, you have got the vulnerable. Prof Chipungu yesterday in his opening remarks uh, spoke about women. I thought that we should also add the youth because we also know that our, our population dynamics is such that we've got more young people and they are very agitated and they, they are trying to find space. But I also thought that this, the state is also about the systems. Um, so what are the laws? I, I hear a lot of discussion about um, uh, the legislation, about the beliefs. Uh, I think some of the things that uh, have wanted Zimbabwe and South Africa, for example, um, pre-independence is, is, is the belief that one race is better than the other, for example. Um, but also, what are some of the principles that, that we, 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 we live with? So, uh, in terms of, of just setting the scene, my, my, my argument is that cities and urban spaces have always been designed on the basis of exclusion. So, what we are now trying to do is how do we move from that uh, polar to the other one where we want to include, uh, we want to include as many people as possible. But I also want to argue that there are two types of exclusion. We've got internal and then we've got uh, external inclusion. And then I'll try to, to illustrate my point here. So if you, if you talk about pre-independent Zimbabwe, and I need to be corrected, but also apartheid South Africa, there was a lot of external, exclu external exclusion. 
because efforts were made to make sure that the Africans had no reason except gainful employment to come to the urban areas. Um, so I, I, I know this because I also experienced it with my father. Almost every male in the two countries had to maintain two homes, one in the rural and the other in the urban areas. So the, the rural was where the family stayed. The urban is where the father went to work. And I know that during weekends, there would, there would be this huge trek on Fridays with the males going back home and then coming back on Sunday to, to come to work on Monday. But what was interesting was that once one was able to penetrate the urban space, they were also then met with internal exclusion. And I just want to put a graphic here about the uh, city of Harare, but this is true for all the cities in Zimbabwe. Um, so what we have is um, the city is actually divided into four uh, sectors. So you've got the low density, this is pre-independence, which was dominated by, by the whites, um, high-end services, well-developed infrastructure, well-policed, the environment was very clean. And then you had the medium density, uh, mainly uh, with the Asian community. Um, it was very closed, uh, but also had very well-developed centers. And then if you move, um, we had the medium to high density, and this is where uh, the, the colors were. Um, the, it was not um, as developed as the medium for, for the Asians, for example. Um, that's where you begin to, to get used to the road. There was limited formal employment opportunities. And then you had the high or the, high, or the out high density areas where the African state, the, the infrastructure was dilapidated. It was located close to the industrial areas because the idea was that they come for employment, so they work in the industry and then they go back home. And you know they need to be very close to where they are working. But what was also interesting about this graphic is that um, of these um, four, the, 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 the wind in, in, in Zimbabwe, for example, blows from the north downwards. So all the fumes and the smoke from the industrial areas actually was, uh, was felt by the people that were in the high or ultra high density areas. So when we now talk about um, exclusion. I thought that it was important to understand it at, at different levels. So for me, there's a general level. Uh, and the first one is that there's inadequate understanding of the fact that people can be in a city, but they can still be excluded from participating meaningfully in and accessing the services that are on offer. So it doesn't, may, it doesn't mean that when one person is staying in the city, they're actually included because part of it was less, you know, you have, you are, you have got an inclusive city if anyone comes into the city. But I think the issue is, um, is, is much deeper than that. And then um, in, the, in, the, in the Inclusive Cities Conference, the last one, Prof Chipungu actually made a very important point. And what he was saying, we're talking about housing. And then he said that the housing designs are not designed for the poor. My argument is also that we, we, we still have to appreciate that the urban space is not designed for the poor and the vulnerable. We need to, to understand that the city, like I've already said, um, its basis is economic, you know, um, but we are now also having high rates of urbanization, which cannot cope with the provision of basic services, such as water, sewer, roads, waste management, electricity, uh, social amenities, and even formal employment. But if we look at the government uh, level, and I, I speak with a little bit of authority because I spent 15 years in government, and I know that we have got degraded state institutions, which are ill-equipped to perform the planning and development roles. Um, if you walk into any provincial planning office in Zimbabwe right now, uh, you'll be very surprised that they don't have the latest technology, even in terms of mapping, mapping and designing and they are still using very antiqu antiquated um, technologies. And this doesn't bode well when you, when you begin to talk about, about inclusion. Um, but I, I went to university with Prof Chipungu, and in our first semester, we were taught about the fundamental urban planning principles, and there were four of them. It was about making, making sure that in any design, there is convenience, there is safety, there is functionality, and there is aesthetics. And I want to put it to the house that all those four principles um, are no longer at play at the moment. I think that the urban space has become one of the most inconvenient. I was just looking at, 
had the graphic that Prof Rajendra put up, uh, where people are now ordering pizzas from from their cars. The city is not safe. It's not functional. The, the, the traffic jams that people experience, but especially the last one, the city is no longer the pleasant place where all of us aspired to go to. Um, I know that in Harare, for example, um, it's just now, it's concrete all over where you go because there are very few green spaces where people can, can go and relax, but also even to allow the cities to breathe. Um, I also I also think that it is important to understand that we've got antiquated planning legislation. I saw in one of the comments uh, the fact that um, some people are still using laws as far back as 1933 in Zimbabwe, for example. And what we do is we amend one section and we, are, we, we, we make changes to the next session, and it's really not working. But my biggest problem, um, which I've had for so many years, is that the planning legislation is actually based on a deemed refusal. So the, the first thing that a planner says when there's a development which is coming is to say no to it. And then you work towards uh, deemed acceptance. And my fight with, with planning legislation in Zimbabwe has always been, let's, let's go the other way, where we, it's deemed acceptance. And then um, we try to see how best we can, we can, we can uh, manage development. We also have a retrogressive development control system. It's about control. It's not about management. Um, in Zimbabwe, we have seen a lot of um, an override of politics over planning. So even the planning decisions are made based on the politics of the day. And that makes life very difficult for the planners themselves, but also for the people that are supposed to be enjoying the services that the city offers. Um, it's not by, by, by accident that I put the last point in red, because I think it's a really, really a red flag for me. Um, increasingly, we have got an, a muted urban population which lacks basic civic awareness. We have got uh, a population that, that has no idea what planning legislation is about, what are the provisions of the, of the different planning acts, and what is the role of, of civil society and, 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 and the people in the urban spaces in general to challenge some of the developments that are, that are taking place. Um, and I know that um, there have been a lot of cases in Zimbabwe where a development goes up and the people have not been consulted at all. And, and all they see is this structure coming up and they seem powerless actually to try and, uh, and intervene or even stop it. I think at the, at the, at the technical level, um, I, I still find that there's a serious lack of appreciation of the role of modern technology in urban design, in planning and development. I think that there are some cities that have done very well, but most of the planners are actually lagging behind. And I want to link this to the next point, which is in terms of uh, innovation. I think planning has not moved. One of the guys in the comments said planners are interested in maintaining the status quo. Um, it's something that we really have to, to try and understand how to move forward on. I also think that um, planning has almost adopted a one-size-fits-all approach to inclusion in urban spaces and this, this doesn't get us anywhere. My biggest problem really is that we don't have data-driven urban planning and development. And I've always challenged planners in Zimbabwe, for example, and, and Doc Mbata, I think it will be the same with South Africa. If I was to ask you today, how many people are in Devon right now? You wouldn't come to 15% accuracy because we don't have, and how it's, it's difficult for me to understand how we can actually plan for a population that we don't know how many people there are. And, and I, I see a lot of comments in the, in the, in the comment box about um, uh, we are planning for the unknown and so on and so forth. That's fine. I think what is even worse is that we are planning for the number of people that we don't know. And even if we're going to categorize, and I'm sorry to, to talk about Devon because I went to Devon and I fell in love with the place um, about a year ago. We also don't even know the number of people that are living with disability. And, and how, how, how is it possible that we, we can plan? So I think one of the key takeaways for this uh, conference for me would be how do we get data-driven planning and development? I also think that we don't have uh, a criteria for measuring inclusion in urban spaces. Um, but let me hasten to say perhaps that we don't have criteria that is Afrocentric. Um, I think that most of the criteria that we are using is based on the, on the global north um, 
but but the, the the challenges and the opportunities that we have are actually different from them. And my last point is also a point that I think Dr. Mbata, you have mentioned in that it's no, we don't have enough guided research on how to promote inclusivity in, in urban spaces. So most of the research that we are doing is actually abstract. Um, so at the infrastructure level, um, so we have infrastructure and buildings that are not designed to promote inclusivity. I've got just a few pictures to share. So that picture is, uh, is ablution facilities in, in, in First Street in Harare. And uh, just imagine you have to go down those steps. And if you are if you are disabled and you've got a wheelchair, I don't I'm not so sure how helpful that would be. Um, I'm very ashamed to put this picture because that's that's my office block. That's a fire escape. Um, so even for me, if there's a fire in that building, I'm not so sure that I'll reach the ground in one piece. Um, and so we think we need to be to be asking ourselves. Uh, how do we get infrastructure that that speaks to the issues that we are talking about? Uh, I just put here, this is uh, in Blueo, a city that I also love a lot. Uh, someone is trying to get onto public transport. And um, you can tell already, even he himself is struggling. How much more for someone who, who is on a wheelchair and who wants to go home? Um, but most of our buildings are frequented, which are frequented by people with disability, for example were constructed before inclusion considerations gained momentum. So this is in a hospital, and these guys are trying to get a patient up the stairs to go to, 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 to be seen by a doctor or something like that. And I, I think that we, we really need to be thinking to ourselves, how do we move forward from, from issues of this nature? And I also put it yesterday, there was also an issue to do with, uh, with building materials and regulations that make it really difficult for the poor to construct and, and own houses. It's just, it, it just gets away from them in terms of cost um, and issues of that nature. So moving forward, uh, these are some of the things that I think we should try to consider. There's need for an integrated and concerted effort to understand the barriers to inclusion within the urban space. And I want to emphasize the word integrated because I think a lot of people have tried but we have done it from silos and we have not really come together as stakeholders to try and understand um, what we can do with some of the challenges that we, are, that we face. Um, I, I also note that we've already spoken about the leave no one behind, uh, with what implications the do no harm principles in urban planning, design and development. Um, and, and this becomes critical now, especially as we, we try to attain the, the sustainable development goals. And like I've already said, there's need for a multi-stakeholder, multifunctional, and multi-purpose approach to inclusive city development. It is not possible to, to look at a city um, in a unilateral manner. We just have to try and bring all the pieces together. I know that it is a difficult and complicated jigsaw puzzle, but I think that we also have no choice in terms of making sure that um, the city becomes what we want it to be for, for everyone. I think this is our biggest challenge because you have got different socioeconomic groups, you have got different interests, and you need just to try to bring them together to try and develop a city that, um, like my previous key speaker I said, it's a city that we want to have, but it's also a city that serves the purposes of as many people as, um, as possible. But we need to understand the role of the city as an important gear for political, social, economic, and cultural development. Um, I've, I've hammered the point in terms of the city being an economic space, but it is much more than that. Um, I think more and more it is becoming cultural, and we need to understand how that works uh, against some of the some of the economic and political beliefs that we hold. So finally, for me, I just thought I would give you what I consider to be the pillars for inclusivity in, in, in urban spaces. Um, and I think that accessibility is key, uh, whichever way you look at it. I think that the city still has to be affordable. Um, the city has to be resilient. Um, and, and I think, like my, my colleagues have already mentioned, COVID-19 just showed us how unprepared we are um to to deal with things that that come at us like like how covid did 
and then the city has to be sustainable. Um, and I think if we try to look at these four pillars, um, we should be able to get some some grip in terms of uh, of promoting inclusivity and allowing the state to perform the functions as it the state as it as we have defined it to perform the functions that um, it should perform. So I just put in my contact details there. Um, I'm very willing and uh, and excited for for people to get in touch so that we can continue this discussion. Um, and Dr. Mbata, I would like to thank you so much uh, for giving me the opportunity just to share my, my thoughts with you. Thanks a lot. Uh, Prof, thank you so much for your time and uh, for your very so thought provoking, uh, provoking presentation. And I do like the, the, the depth and the granularity at which you've gone at uh, in terms of pinpointing exactly where exclusion is because to talk about inclusion, inclusive cities we need to understand where places of exclusions are. Of course, you begin with being completely provocative and saying that cities are spaces of exclusions and exploitation. Um, and may one may add to that, that also spaces of overconsumption, um, of opulence, uh, that of course deals with the issues of ecological uh, health um, or, of, of, of the world that we live in because if cities are consuming and yet they're not growing the food, where is the food coming from? Uh, if they are consuming fast fashion, um, where is that fast fashion coming from and where are the resources to build that? Yeah, so he said, nah, I, I really find it a very, very, very impressive uh, beginning point. And then of course the internal and external exclusions of government, especially at the government level where you, you have a degraded state institution as you state uh, that are almost incapable of doing the things they're supposed to do in terms of planning and development um, or meeting their developmental duties. How does the state become a developmental state um, when its institutions are er eroded themselves? Uh, then of course you talk about inadequate planning and legislation. And I think it's, 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 a, it's, it's an issue that cuts across a lot of post-colonial cities where you have an ordinance, an ordinance act in South Africa of, of 1933 um, uh, with a bit of tweaks to, uh, to include those where, that were excluded, but the very foundation of this legislation is still very premised on the idea of exclusion, um, either now uh, from, from the sort of capitalistic framework or, you know, rather than before from the framework of, of racial exclusion and so forth. So, I find that provocation quite quite impressive, Prof. And thank you so much for that. Um, um, and of course, the, the the usual that we face in a lot of global South cities, the override of politics, um, the override of of politics over planning, um, that sometimes political sentiments um, uh, override the, the planning processes and planning principles. And I think that links very closely, which to the subject that you touched on, which is pretty close to my heart. I can not tell you, by the way, uh, how many people we have in a tick meeting. It, may, it would be probably probably 85% to 95% close, uh, Prof. So this time, because I work with data, so I, I'm, 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 I'm able to answer a bit better, but I do agree with you that we have no idea who we are planning for. We have no idea what kind of exclusions exist and how, how then to achieve those exclusions because we don't plan driven, we don't have data driven um, uh, planning processes. So I think that issue um, is, is, is something something very, very important to, uh, to look at. I, I've shared, I've taken the liberty to share some of the stuff that we've been doing around data in the Tiquin municipality as an example, just to demonstrate how you could have data driven planning processes and decision processes as well. Um, I do love how you go deeper into a technical level of, of, of exclusion as well. So the lack of um, of ability, I think I would put it more as a lack of ability um, to use modern technology uh, to, to facilitate inclusion, the lack of planning um, innovation that the planning fraternity itself lacks um, the ability to, to innovate, uh, they lack the, the capacity to be experimental, and as a result, we duplicate problems again and again. The one for size fit all is well articulated in your presentation, and perhaps you leave us with um, the, the, the best uh, wrap of the session itself in terms of the key words around uh, what, what inclusion means um, in terms of accessibility, not just in, in, terms of, in terms of infrastructure. Of course, you talk about infrastructure level um, of, of, of exclusions as well. 
which I won't go into detail with, and I don't want to paraphrase all your presentation because I might water it down uh, because you would present it in a much more powerful way. But I do like the four terminologies that you've used on accessibility, affordability, resilience, and sustainability um, as a foundation of, of, of inclusion. This is the only way you can measure inclusion if your, your city donor covers all these aspects and includes everyone. Uh, Prof. Kamundanje, uh, thank you so much for your time and really, really appreciate your, your presence in this session. Uh, um, and I hope you'll be able to uh, to answer questions. And Prof has, um, has been very kind to give to leave out to leave his uh, contact details um, to to the panelists. And and I hope that the organizing team will be able to share that and the prof um, and the LinkedIn profile. So Prof, I thank you once again uh, for your for your thought provoking presentation. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we now move to the session on the question and engagement. Um, there's been a lot of questions that are here, and some of them are not necessarily directed to our speakers, but they are very broad questions that I've captured uh, here. But I will uh, I will also allow the organizing team um, to um, open up the Q and A. Okay, there's, it's already open as well. Um, these questions that are open on the Q and A that we may have to cover. So I will want to start with the ones I was capturing on, uh, on the chat. One comes from Dr. Um, Madiese. Um, I'm, I hope I'm not butchering your name. Um, um, so maybe I'll go on first name basis just to make sure that I sometimes don't butcher people's names because that is very dis disrespectful. Uh, Dr. Samuel, how can, marry, how can we marry together the capitalist ideology that has characterized uh, characterized our development processes with inclusivity. How can the poor afford the new order in the development since capitalism tends to move development out of reach? Um, and I think it's a very, it's a very, very important question. And this question, I would, I would direct it to Prof Kumar because you touched very briefly, Prof Kumar, on, on, on how these mega developments uh, sometimes facilitate or often facilitate the proliferation, pro proliferation of informal settlements in and around those areas. How do we maintain that balance of this sort of capitalist ideology, which of course is expressed in the form of these mega development and investment? Uh, Prof, can I give you a minute uh, to take that question and any other of the, of the keynote speakers could come in and answer that question, please. Yes, thank you so much, sir. I mean, I, I completely agree with you. This is a very serious concern about, you know, this, you know, um, we, we call it a, like a high class or working class. I mean, I mean, if I have to simplify this, this terminology of capitalism and uh, so, I mean, the answer is, I mean, the answer is there that there is a no easy answer. You know, uh, and I absolutely agree about the power of economy is also very important. You know, what happened in the case of, uh, you know, let's say uh, Dubai or any mega city uh, recently happened in Doha also, you know, Doha, everything looks very fancy, but there is also a dark side of a Doha development for this FIFA World Cup. Uh, the challenges are yes, and I, I believe that, you know, um, what the future is there, that we should learn from examples. We should learn from our mistake. And they, they, I mean, I'll, I'll give you a small core, I mean, anecdote about this example of Doha City. Uh, you know, when like uh, uh, five, six years back before COVID, when there was a lot of uh, uh, discussion about, you know, this uh, working class people were not very, not very well treated for, you know, the development of a, a preparation of a Doha city for the world, uh, for the FIFA World Cup. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the royal prince of uh, Doha, Doha, Doha city, I mean, when it, it, it came in there in his notice, then he became a very vocal because, and he said that, you know, I will make sure that all the citizens, all the working people of, you know, the small cities, I mean, of, of Doha cities development, they should be treated as a, a good human right, uh, you know, for good life. And here, you know, the power of vocal, I mean, in one of the slides, what I mentioned about it, what I think and what I say. So I think every citizen should be vocal if there is any issues. Now I'll come on the example what we are doing in 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 general in Indian cities because you know the power you know the problem of any mega project 
and no provision of a working class is the reason for a new slum nearby. So what is happening in uh, in our planning system in India, which, which we are integrating is that, you know, if there is a development of, you know, this mega project, then there should also be the pallet development of EWS. When I'm saying EWS means economical weaker section. So the provision of EWS, the integration of EWS, uh, uh, housing and you know the uh, you know the market and everything for those economical weaker section is also you know the integrated into our newer planning system of any mega project so it is very essential to have a, you know the provision of these working class people also as a part of a, uh, this thing so yes i mean these are a small steps but the, the things are changing and it will take time and i'm i'm not saying the change will come tomorrow i mean it will take time but you know we are Stepping toward the solution. Uh, thank, thank you, Prof. Kumar. Um, uh, Prof. Lauren, I'm over to you because you you threw in this this provocation as well about planning for cities we don't we 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 don't know yet. Um, and there's a question around how do we plan for for those kind of cities? I guess as planners we have a difficult role. Um, and that's uh, it's a comment um, at the end uh, by Prof. Magidimesha. Um, Maybe yeah. just... well, thank you very much uh, for directing this question to me. Uh, just, you know, like two comments. First of all, we have to understand that there are no solid divisions between the rich and poor, so to speak, right? I mean, to some extent, they are artificial because, uh, you know, I mean, when we are looking at this kind of rich type of the development, we have to understand that they are not existing in vacuum. They are existing in some kind of social and economic environment and uh, they basically interact to some extent right so actually uh, the developers of that they also have to take into account the general interest of the city and the general so to speak uh, uh, interest of the entire community not just of their target group so to speak as otherwise uh, these developments would never exist and would never be able to function uh, properly uh, I mean, I'm fully aware of the social differences between some of the European countries and some of the African countries with the South Africa, especially um, uh, on top of that, you know, I'm, I know Durban quite well, I've been there many times and just recently, just two weeks ago, so, so basically I'm fully aware of all the issues and problems which are existing over there, uh, but we have to understand that uh, actually uh, uh, you know, once we are kind of working on some kind of the project on this, so to speak, high end and so on, that actually not only the very rich and very privileged will be using that, okay? I mean, this project has to be open, has to be available, has to be accessible uh, for all possible um, uh, visitors, customers, whatever we call them, basically speaking, right? So the entire community in the end, right? As otherwise, it will not be able to function. And a very good example is actually can be found in US, you know, in the 1960s and 70s and 80s, when the developers in the US of the shopping centers, they were conceptualizing supper centers as the, as, the, uh, as the temples of luxury. And then they immediately realized that there are not so many of, the, of that rich people which will be able to provide them um uh, uh, to provide them kind of enough customers so they immediately defined uh, something which they called uh, festival marketplaces which offered not only options for the for the for the very high end customers but also for the low end customers uh, just in order to mix them and in order to get a kind of uh, image of having a, a kind of offer for everyone and actually what turned out is that actually in the end those rich people also shopped in these places which were designed for, uh, for to speak, other clientele and vice versa, you know, those people who in theory were supposed just to spend $1 per item, in the end they were going to some other places which in theory <coughs> were not conceptualized for the, for the, for the, for the less privileged uh, customers, right? So this is first thing, right? I mean, so that we are actually living in a kind of symbiotic uh, uh, environment and we just have to realize it's not exclusive, okay? It has to be symbiotic, right? So this is the first thing. And the second thing is that when we speak about inclusion, we are not talking only about inclusion of the underprivileged or the general community. We are also talking about including, in example, business sector, which is frequently excluded from our the discussions we focus on the needs of the of the underprivileged of the poor of the certain social groups but when we do not realize that um, actually the real 
uh, development processes are perpetuated by the business sector, which is often excluded from these discussions. So uh, sorry for maybe, you know, a little bit changing the narrative of this session, but I'm actually saying is that we should not just look um, at this problem only from the uh, from uh, why from one angle point of view or one side point of view. So that would be my my comment to that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. That uh, I think I think that that is um, acceptable in this session because we also don't want to prescribe how the conversation flows. Um, and of course, the state, as you suggested, that uh, we cannot predict cities, and neither can we predict conversations about cities. Uh, we cannot predict conversations about the state because the nature of the state always fluctuates, um, despite its frameworks that it's built upon. But from here, I want to quickly move to. Uh, back to Prof. Um, uh, Prof. Joseph um, on the question that Taye asked: How could we get political leaders to appreciate and commit to plan to planning emerging cities, especially where citizens build and create communities ahead of city planners? I think it it, it touches very briefly to to your to your provocative comment around the overriding of politics over planning. Um, how do you balance the two? And I guess. Godfrey, uh, Godfred is, is is trying to really ascertain in how do you balance those and and any any thoughts on your end, uh, Prof. Okay, so thank you very much. It's um yeah, it's an intriguing and uh, discussion, and I don't think that there are any correct answers as far as that is concerned. I think that what we I I agree with uh, Prof. Lauren that um our approach to inclusivity, just as much as to urban development, should be making sure that every stakeholder comes to play. And politicians are also part of that. And we need to understand that they've got their own pressure points. Uh, my experience is that if we explain properly what we are trying to achieve with politicians, then they more often than not come to the side which makes more sense to them. And I think as planners, one of our failures is that we have allowed ourselves to be so much in awe of the politicians, but to the extent that we actually don't give them the information that they require. I worked with local urban authorities, with rural authorities, and the biggest problem that I found was that we never gave them enough data for them to make a decision. And they are going to make political decisions, and those political decisions are not necessarily rational. So we need to create a platform for them to make rational policy decisions. And let's move away from the politics to the policy of, of planning. I think that will be my, my quick response to that. Um, yeah, but 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 whilst I still have the floor, Dr. Bata, so this question about um, planners and, and planning for things that we don't know, if I'm going to be cynical, my argument will be that that's what planning is about. Planning is about planning for what is not known. And I think what we have to develop as planners is the skill to forecast. So at the moment, COVID came and we're not prepared for, for it. I think the planners that are going to make great progress are the planners that are going to say to us, the next crisis is going to come in 2025 and is going to be based on these principles. I think one of the skills that the planners don't have is the skill to forecast. And I think that's something that we need to. Planning is always about the future anyway, and no one knows the future. So what we are trying to do is to use what we know to try and predict what it's going to look like. And um, yeah, we should be on the way. So thanks and sorry for getting more involved in, uh, in this area. Thank you. No, 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 no. Don't, don't apologize, uh, colleagues. I, I must apologize to the audience because they may seem may think that I'm running uh, I'm running over time in the program. But I've made an executive decision to go until twenty past eleven uh, with this discussion. Then we'll move to breakout rooms, and um, because uh, I think this it's very very important to engage and engage strongly uh, on these matters, so it doesn't become a a, a a space of just dropping the information and leaving, but there's some serious questions that need to be uh, to be unpacked. But maybe on, on on your question and your 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 rather very sort of robust uh, criticism of, of of planning and planning profession and and, and planning professionals themselves uh, and where they are, uh, there's there's a leading question to uh, that comes out after that, um, uh, Prof. Joseph. But I'll I'll probably give it to uh, Prof. Kumar. 
why do we planners continue the, the status quo? And um, if that's, we know that we are not empowering our, our politicians um, uh, with data, with tools to make informed decisions so that they can change policies, why are we returning the status quo? And I know Prof Kumar, you are, you are an architect, um, but you fall within the, the built environment space. Why are we maintaining that kind of status quo? Uh, very, very briefly, um, uh, Prof, thanks. You know, I, I'm, in a way, I don't agree that we purposely, we don't, we don't provide, you know, the data and all. So whatever, with our limited capacity or whatever, with our limited expertise or, or knowledge, and when I'm saying limited means like, you know, uh, I mean, limited may not be the correct word, what our best ability and best available data, what we can uh, provide, we do that. I am not very sure about the example of West, but uh, at least you know this part of uh, this part of the world, I and mean, especially I'm talking about Asian cities. Whatever information we can we can find it, and we can, we can definitely we provide them. I mean, and we do have uh, the many time you know the politician they also they they choose to select what is the information or what is the the suggestion is suitable for their political interest or their you know the limit. I mean the uh, it's not always a political interest. It's always about you know knowing their own, the the capacity. So yes, I mean there is there will be always saffronage. There will be always saffronage. So I mean from actual information to the information to planner, and from pl planner to information to political, and political to uh, to you know the actual implementation. So there will be saffronage. So that will be always there. No, thanks, thanks, Prof Kumar, for for that. Uh, provocative response that it, despite the tools available to make informed decisions politicians will remain part and parcel of the political game and um, which may uh, which means or may mean in some instances that certain decisions will be made made based of this on those political instincts from there i'll quickly move um to another question um around um, informality. Um, I'm just gonna skip Yona's question and Yona's question, um, uh, 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 Prof. Is, is, uh, uh, Prof. Yosef is about the main challenge with planning in Malawi is multiple land administrators. How is Zimbabwe addressing this? And I think it's a question that's just very pointed at that. You could answer that also on the chat if there's um, a sort of a much more pointed response to that. Um, but I'll move to the next questions on informality. Um, uh, uh, Prof Chipungu is asking, informality is here to stay and it's high time we consider the generation, the, the consider generating planning strategies and tools that are directed towards ameliorating challenges we are facing. Are there any tools, strategies, um, uh, under tech, other technical ebonism that can be used to respond to informal ebonism in, in, in a positive way. And I do like the paradox of informal ebonism um, as well, because I find it very paradoxical, but I'll, I'll throw it at you, Prof. Lauren, um, and I like take, catching you guys off guard, so I don't prepare these questions and they come to me and I use my, uh, my chairing um, um, uh, had to uh, and powers to direct it wherever I want directed to. But Prof. Lauren, um, do you want to uh, engage with that question? Yeah, please? just a very brief answer. From my point of view, informal urbanism needs informal planning, basically speaking, right? So, and this is actually something we have to learn because, as I mentioned in my presentation, we are actually living in the world that planning are governed by the very rigid uh, state regulations. And, you know, it's fully understandable. It's part of law, right? I mean, through planning, we actually are making law to some extent. The problem is, is that, uh, uh, you know, when we are dealing with the informal uh, problems and issues and with the informal communities, you know, just uh, planning tools, I mean, I mean, the legal planning tools are just not uh, seeing these problems, right? So we have to go beyond them and we have to, uh, to do that. And then maybe in the end, we might end up with the situation that our planning system will be revised and that actually we might have this kind of the uh, informal tools and instruments included in the in the planning system as formal tools and instruments, uh, but the nature of those will be probably very different to that what we know at the moment. But from now, you know, I would say informal urbanism needs informal planning, and then we may just hope that this informal planning will become part of the daily practice, according to that quote that everything which is not forbidden is allowed and is and is recommended. Uh, th thank you so much, Prof, for that uh, for that answer. Um, so I've, we've got 
two minutes. Uh, so I'm going to give uh, Prof, uh, uh, Prof Joseph time to answer that question. Uh, if you've had time to think about it in terms of land administration uh, in Zimbabwe and how Zimbabwe is addressing that. That question is from Miona, um, who, who, who would like to make that comparison um, in, in how Zimbabwe is dealing with these issues of land of multiple land administra uh, administrators uh, versus what's going on um, in, in, in Zimbabwe. Uh, thank you, Doc. So that's a very complex and difficult question. You know the history of Zimbabwe with land um, and Prof Chipong will tell you that whilst things were a little bit more orderly before 2000, once the land reform uh, happened, uh, which was supposed to be more on the rural with the farms and so on, um, the urban areas were also not spared. So we've got a phenomenon called the land barons. Uh, the guys that just went and took over land that was not theirs. Um, and they began to parcel it out and sell out the stands. So I think what, is, uh, what has been happening increasingly, especially in the last five years, is a situation whereby local authorities are beginning to use long-term plans in the form of master plans and local plans to try and guide the process of, of land administration and to try and take back the control. So there's still some way to go, but I think that um, the, the only way I see is to have um, long-term development plans and also make sure that the, the provisions of those long-term plans are adhered to. So that will be my quick response to that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. I've got two last questions. Uh, one I'll direct it to uh, Prof. Kumar because it talks to the issues of architects. Um, that's from Orienade. Uh, it says, I wanted to ask about architects designing for inclusivity, seeing as most of the world's population lives under the poverty line. How do, how do you think local architects can design user-friendly and inclusive buildings, especially in an informal and local built environment? And, and, and that question, Prof, please answer it. And, and for, my, for my selfish reasons, answer it with uh, with the, the the verticality in mind because if you combine inclusivity and and verticality and the complexity of building in a vertical way in an in an informal way uh, while you're going vertical how do those worlds collide and how do you reconcile those those those, those worlds um, and very quickly prof thank you yes thank you so much for asking this question and i believe that this question has a two different you know the approach also first of all if you are asking that you know the, you know the designing of building for you know um, the lower society of people or let's say like unprivileged people i mean there are enough example about you know uh, about for not only in, in asia or africa or all part of the world that there is a low income housing or you know the the social housing in America, Latin America, America, and everywhere there is enough example. So there is there is a provision for that. But I'm more interested about answering your question about that. That does verticality of the city include this uh, uh, less privileged people? Yes, the answer is yes. I mean, it is there. But if if there is a sensitivity, we are talking about the example of uh, this project. I mean, this EWS uh, economical weaker section housings, which is I mean in in Delhi also there is a, a there is a project which is going on like a 192 meter, which is almost, almost like a 50 story tower. I mean, the, the tower which is designed as a slum rehabilitation. So here 25% of the total, total uh, housing unit are given to uh, less privileged people, those economical weaker sections. Uh, and you know, the remaining is for the real estate. Yes, there are examples, but I, I believe that, you know, uh, had I been having a longer time, I could have made a presentation, but you can, uh, I'm tapping the project name in uh, in the chat box. You can refer to that case study, and uh, otherwise, I'm also leaving my. Um, I left my number. I can I can explain you more in detail of of screen if you can. But uh, yes, I mean that's uh, that that is a good case study for everyone to refer about this verticality and integration of a less privileged people. I'm I'm just tapping the project name in the chat box. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Prof. I appreciate it. One last question, and I, I almost forgot about Prof. I focused only on, on, my, uh, on my keynotes because I almost forgot about Professor Mulafu. But Prof. Mulafu, you get the, the benefit of having the final question that comes from Dr. Logia about the bottom-up approach to urban design and planning. Um, she asked, what about the bottom-up approach to urban design and urban planning in what we are talking about? Because we seem to be talking about planners and we are talking about um, sort of these sort of pre-established um, professionals that have um, 
uh, I don't want to say indoctrinated, but there's a, there's a certain software and hardware that has been installed and it's been installed through academic institutions and also not necessarily through the needs of what's coming up from the bottom, but also through you know the school of, of, of urban planning and urban design uh, that in itself has, has a lot of faults. But what about the, the, the bottom-up approaches uh, that are coming out from grassroots, from communities themselves? Uh, Prof Mulwami, do you want to take that last question, please? Assuming that Prof is not able to answer. Prof, Prof, uh, Prof Lauren, can I throw that question at you, please? I'm picking, yeah, sorry, you, le you have to drop the call. I'm terribly sorry about that, you know, sorry, uh, you know, you are living only three lives at the same time, you know, so this is how it works. No okay, uh, um, uh, if you could just please repeat the question because I, I was on the phone, sorry about that. Yeah, no worries, it's, it's a question about what about bottom-up approach oh, to... Okay. Okay, got it. Okay, so this question about the bottom-up approach to urban design and planning. I mean, this is actually what I'm arguing for, right? So that actually this informal urbanism is associated not only with just participation and discussion, but also with a kind of uh, forming a kind of bottom-up re bottom recommendations uh, regarding the spatial solutions. And this is something which is especially important regarding the inclusive uh, cities and regarding the um, inclusive environment, so that we are actually not only just talking about uh, the needs and necessities for the certain groups of people, but we are also talking about the solutions. And we are uh, actually capitalizing on this kind of bottom-up ideas. But then we need to form on that basis a kind of more coherent structures. And this is actually where we need qualified planners, uh, when we need qualified urban designers and specialists in the area, which uh, know how to actually make these urban designs and urban plans and, and, and how to propose certain spatial solutions. But, you know, on the basis of that, what actually uh, the community uh, needs are and what are the stakeholders needs are. And that's actually what I tried to present also in my presentation, uh, that these activities of the Office of the Gdansk City Architect are actually based on that. So before we start designing something, we actually start talking to all the stakeholders, gather their ideas, opinions, ideas, and concepts, and then on that basis to form the professional solutions. This is a kind of the different approach to, to design, although we still need uh, uh, this kind of input into the final design. Sorry for getting a little bit, uh, going a bit longer over time. No, not a problem, Prof. Thank you so much. Really, really appreciate that answer. And uh, I'll take this opportunity to thank all our speakers, particularly the keynote speakers, the people who welcomed us, um, and to thank academics in this space, because I think there's a lot of intellectual labor that academics put in place to enhance and enrich the knowledge that we have in order to plan better, to understand our communities better. And very often academics are not given um, the, the flowers, as people say, they are right flowers, they're rightful, uh, rightful flowers, um, while they are still with us. So I really appreciate the intellectual labor that you guys put in uh, to think through some of these things, uh, to write about them and to share them with us in these kind of platforms. I'm grateful because I'm, I'm obviously a, reco a recovering academic, so I don't have to go through the pain uh, of dealing with, um, uh, with publications and dealing with uh, academic institutions. Uh, the next session now is going to be break, uh, breakaway rooms. Um, there's breakaway room one um, that's going to deal with governance and institutions and promoting inclusivity. And you will see that Shakila has already, um, has already put um, the links on to those rooms. Uh, so you click on the link and it takes you to the room. And room two is inclusive planning, um, planning ideology and processes. And breakaway room three is technology and data to promote inclusivity. I think that's going to be interesting spaces where uh, you we could, could um, engage more, have more, much more nuanced conversations around these three um, uh, sections. So, colleagues, thank you so much for indulging me. So, let's go to those rooms and uh, and have deeper conversations. And I am I'm grateful for the respect that you've given. And I know that we've stayed in 120 participants or so. Mm -hmm. We've luckily. Sorry, Chair. So, sorry to, to cut you in. I think Sam, uh, Dr. Sam will have to give some a brief explanation on that. Uh, on the group, on the on those oh, rooms. Okay, no problem, no problem, Prof. They they can um I'm going with the program that I've been given, so it didn't really give me much. Please come come through.
Dr. Sam? Yes, I'm coming. Mute while you try to because what it does is that the sound of the okay. Sorry, I'm trying to share, I'm trying to share my screen briefly. So, I'm sorry, let me just look at uh, what I needed to. Okay. Yeah, I hope you can see my screen at this point. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, the, I want to use this opportunity to welcome everybody. To yes, some mode, please. Can I do what on um, presentation mode? Yeah, it is. Is it okay now? Uh, it will be. Taking a bit of time. Yeah, it, it, it would come up. It's already on presentation mode at this time. So um, when, when we're talking about the subject of inclusivity or exclusion, as I have put it here, which is the subject matter of our discussion in this uh, year's uh, symposium, uh, one way or the other, irrespective of the environment that you have found yourself, you you have to align with one part of it or the other is either you have an environment that is inclusive or you are how you have an environment where exclusion prevails now in whatever way that you have uh, operates whether an inclusive environment or exclusion irrespective of your race or your gender your age or anyone there is a dimension of either inclusivity or exclusion that prevails in your environment. It's either the physical dimension, the social inclusivity, or the economic inclusivity. However, at the, the pedestal of operating the subject of inclusivity or ensuring that we have an inclusive environment, or if our environment is going to be exclusionary, are these institutions, government institutions, state institutions, bodies put together to ensure that our environments have the outlook which they currently have. So these institutions are the drivers of the subject of inclusivity. There's, their efficiency will determine to a very large extent how the outlook of inclusivity, that's our environment, would present. So in order to enhance the level of inclusivity in our environment, we must improve the capacity of this institution to deliver inclusivity on all fronts, a holistic inclusion, not just physical alone. If you're, if you're physically inclusive, you must also be socially inclusive. If you have taken the physical and social, you must also be economically inclusive. And that is the essence of holistic inclusivity, which we hope that this conference will be able to engender for all our institutions. So in our breakout rooms for today, being the second day, we will be looking at three different rooms. In each of those rooms, we'll be having presentations that borders on governance and institutions in promoting inclusivity. This particular room would be chaired by uh, Mrs. Dockers Mekize uh, Zaki and uh, will be co-chaired by Emmanuel Letebele. And in this room, we'll be having seven presentations. We'll be having seven different presentations, reimagining local government's role in promoting inclusivity, building state capacity for participatory slum upgrading and governance, social housing projects, perpetuating spatial poverty, reducing food loss along value chains. Is inclusive and integrated development really working for South African settlement? Public transport operation and compliance with COVID-19 preventive measures. 
in the cities of southwestern Nigeria, practical guide, guidelines towards successful implementation of land value capture in South Africa. That is the first room. The second room will look at the inclusive planning ideology and processes. This particular room will be chaired by Mr. Martin Lawrence of Southland. And in this room, we'll be having eight presentations. First will be the impact of gentrification on access to resources, understanding inclusive cities, the power of maps, assessing the processes and outcomes of mapping through participatory lens, the imperative of sustainable practices in construction management, identification of indices to quantify gentrification, strategies for enhancing transportation equity, a quality assessment of both e-hailing service delivery in rural towns, municipal land leases, a solution to inclusive social housing. That's what we have in the second room. And the third room is technology and data to promote inclusivity. This room will be chaired by Mr. Orchard Pretorius and Professor Trinos Gumbo of University of Johannesburg. And in this room, we'll be having about eight presentations also. And among them are innovation for digital inclusion in cities, the impact of transit-oriented development on economic access, managing municipal infrastructure using smart city principles, land use planning, a potent approach for accelerating urban resilience, shaping the spaces that shape spaces, evaluating the efficacy of planning in development of basic infrastructure, critical examining professionalization of human settlement sector. And the last but not the least is flawed risk and impact, a case study of University of Venda. All this will be presented in our three rooms. And I also want to call our attention to the fact that uh, some people missed their presentation time yesterday. You can also signify if you missed your time for presentation yesterday in the chat box so that you can be scheduled for presentation in one of our rooms. So you can just drop your comment in the comments in the chat section for those who missed their presentation yesterday and we can take it together. That is it from my point. Thank you very much, everyone. We can now go into our breakout rooms. Thank you.